our scripture reading this morning is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. If you have a Bible handy, you can turn to Isaiah chapter 9 and follow along with us. If you happen to have a smartphone, you can do a Google search on Isaiah 9, 1 through 7 and follow along in that way. Let us read the scripture together. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let us pray. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was about 10 years old, I had this unfortunate habit of rummaging through the attic in the lead up to the Christmas season because I knew that that's where my parents liked to hide all of our Christmas presents. One year, as I was rummaging through the attic, I found a toy robot, and naturally I assumed that it was for me, even though it wasn't something on any of my Christmas lists. And so the next day, I happened to mention to my parents that maybe I might want a toy robot. And they reminded me that I already had one, a really expensive, high-tech, programmable robot that I had got just a few Christmases ago. The one in the attic, by comparison, was pretty cheap and mostly just beeped and ran around in circles. But I had seen the robot, and so I was resolute. I wanted that robot. It had to be mine. It was mine, right? I think in some strange way, I thought I was doing my parents a favor by registering my strong desire for something I assumed they had already gotten me. You can probably imagine my surprise on Christmas morning when one of my younger brothers unwrapped the robot, which had never really been intended for me in the first place, which I had never really wanted in the first place. But after all those weeks of anticipating it, I had become convinced that my life would never be complete without it. And so I sulked and I pouted for the rest of the day. And none of the other presents that I got that year, which I actually had asked for and which were on my Christmas list, none of those presents could possibly be good enough. And I was furious with my little brother, who ironically actually had asked for the robot, and probably the only reason that he even wanted it was to be like his big brother, who already had one. How easy it is to mistake the gift, to confuse what we already have for what we think we want. How easy it is to miss all of the right clues and context and so confuse what's meant for us and what was always meant for someone else. 
Today's scripture passage from Isaiah is very familiar to us this time of year. We especially, around the Christmas season, like to hear verses 6 and 7. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. Despite the references to King David and his throne, when we hear this verse around Christmas time, naturally we assume it must be talking about Jesus, whose birth we celebrate at Christmas. But remember, this passage comes in Isaiah, in the Old Testament. And it was written 700 years before the time of Jesus. Is it a prophecy? Maybe. Many have it interpreted that way. But this passage also made perfect sense in the time in which it was written to the people who first heard it. Some of it might have seemed a little bit prophetic to them, but several other things that we think of as prophecy, they saw already happening around them, and so were not considered prophecy by them. Now, the 7th century BCE was a dark time for the people of northern Israel. Zebulun, Naphtali, and Galilee, all mentioned in the first verse of Isaiah chapter 9. Their once proud country had been overrun and conquered by the Assyrian Empire. Verse 5 of this passage mentions the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood. That was a reality for Israelites in the 7th century BCE. Some of them after Assyria came and conquered them. Some of them were carted away to Assyria as slaves. But thousands of them fled south to a tiny city in a kingdom that was filled with Hebrew-speaking people just like those of northern Israel. That tiny city was in the kingdom of Judah, and the tiny city was named Jerusalem. These refugees likely traveled on foot, hence the line, the people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, that's northern Israel, on them light has now shined. And that light was the light of protection and freedom in Jerusalem, their new home. This great influx of refugees took this tiny city of Jerusalem from a population of just under 1,000 to over 15,000 in just a few short years. That's reflected in verse 3. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. Now about that joy, in America today and probably in Jerusalem today as well, some people see an influx of immigrants and refugees as a bad thing. But in Jerusalem in the 7th century BCE, it would have been an unquestioned positive thing. It meant a larger tax base, for one thing. It meant more soldiers for the army, more skilled labor, and more power and prestige in general for a once tiny, now quickly growing nation. However, in the ancient world, this tiny kingdom still lacked one thing to be a serious player in Middle Eastern geopolitics of the time. A king, the protection and stability of the nation, and more importantly than the king, a line of succession to that king, in other words, the king's sons. Where there were no obvious successors to the king, there would be internal conflict, and knowing this would make the nation vulnerable to attack from outside empires like Assyria or Babylon. In the year 640 BCE, that succession in Jerusalem and in Judah was in question. King Manasseh, a direct descendant of the biblical King David, and the longest reigning king in Judah's history, 
Manasseh was the king who would have overseen Jerusalem's greatest period of expansion with all of the immigrants and refugees coming into the city. That king, Manasseh, had died. His son Ammon was so unpopular that he was assassinated by his own servants just two years into his reign. And so hopes were not very high for the future of the house of David. And with that kind of instability, there was a sense of vulnerability to attack from outsiders. The lone remaining heir to the throne of Jerusalem was an eight-year-old boy, Ammon's only son, named Josiah. It was on this child that all of the hopes of the Hebrew people rested. Many biblical scholars today believe that Josiah is exactly the child that Isaiah is speaking about when he says, a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests, as in already rests, not in the future, not will rest, but authority rests right now on his shoulders. And that authority shall grow continually as he grows into an adult, and there shall be endless peace. That part is a little bit prophetic. For the throne of David and for David's kingdom. Those hopes were not entirely unfounded. King Josiah would go on to reign for 31 years, reforming the laws of Judah and establishing the worship of Yahweh in the temple. The Bible says about this King Josiah in 2 Kings, Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might. Nor did any like him arise after him. That's actually the highest praise given in the Bible to any king, including David and Solomon. And yet, just when those hopes were at their very highest, just when Josiah was putting in place a plan to reunite the southern kingdom of Judah with the northern kingdom of Israel that had been conquered by the Assyrians, reuniting them as one kingdom under God, just when those plans were beginning to take shape, Josiah was called out to battle on the plains of Megiddo, also known as Armageddon. And there on the plain of Armageddon, Josiah was killed by the Pharaoh of Egypt. Josiah was effectively the last king of an independent Jerusalem. And with his death, the royal line of King David effectively came to an end. All the dreams for the restoration of united Israel, all of the promises for endless peace died on that field with King Josiah. And the Hebrew people once more entered into a period of great darkness. But then in the years that followed, something truly remarkable happened. Instead of abandoning hope, instead of forgetting about those words spoken by Isaiah, the Hebrew people, some of them at least, decided that they had simply been wrong about the nature of the gift, not the existence of the gift. Perhaps all of those promises were in fact true, but Josiah was not the one that God had ever intended to carry them out. Perhaps God's anointed king, and in Hebrew, that anointed phrase is Mashiach, which we transliterate as Messiah. Perhaps the Mashiach was still yet to come. And so the people of Israel carried that hope. They carried it with them into exile in Babylon for hundreds of years. When the Jews returned from exile in Babylon, a distant descendant of David, a man named Zerubbabel, helped them to rebuild the walls and the temple in Jerusalem. And so there was hope that maybe Zerubbabel was the king, the long-awaited savior of Israel. But Zerubbabel disappears from the pages of the story about as quickly as he arrives. Then in the second century before Christ, when Jerusalem was occupied by the forces of Alexander the Great, a man named Judas Maccabeus led a successful revolt that temporarily restored the independence of Jerusalem and the worship of Yahweh at the temple. But when Judas Maccabeus fell in battle, once again the hope for a Messiah was pushed forward into the future. 
In the first century AD, many would-be messiahs rose up, this time offering the hope and the promise of deliverance from a new oppressor, the Roman Empire. One of these would-be messiahs was a man named Jesus from Nazareth. His earliest followers saw in him and in his birth story a fulfillment of those ancient words from Isaiah, that a child has been born for us, a son given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. Notice the subtle change in tense that you get in the Greek New Testament version of the Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah. The government will rest upon his shoulder. But just like the followers of King Josiah and Zerubbabel and Judas Maccabeus, the followers of Jesus of Nazareth, too, were ultimately confronted with the death of their Savior at the hands of their enemies. The government never came to rest on the shoulders of Jesus, and peace remained elusive in the first century in the Middle East and the subsequent centuries, too. But the followers of Jesus also made that same crucial decision not to abandon hope, not to forget the promises from the book of Isaiah. They too came to the conclusion that they had simply been mistaken about the nature of the gift, not the existence of the gift. The Messiah, they decided, was not going to be an earthly ruler or king at all, but rather a heavenly king. You see, they believed that Jesus had risen from the dead and that he would come again in the future to make all things right. Fast forward 2,000 years into the current day, and that's what we believe as well. So you'd think that we might finally have learned not to mistake the gift or the nature of the gift. And yet even today, in the year 2020, we still too often place our hope for salvation in our earthly kings and leaders. In addition to all of the other crazy things that have happened in 2020, you may have noticed that it was a presidential election year. And so that means that about half of the people in our country felt like we have been living in a time of great darkness for the past four years, but now that a new president has been elected, we will finally come into the great light of hope for our future. And about another 50%, roughly, of the people in America believe that their candidate was the great hope and light for our future, but since he was not reelected, we will now descend into a time of great chaos and darkness. I'm not convinced by either one of those opinions. I think we are still mistaking the gift. I do believe that we as human beings have always lived in and out of times of great darkness. But as God's people, we've also always carried among us a great light. That light it's not a person. That light is our ability to find hope in the most hopeless situations, to keep faith in God when everything we thought we knew about God's gifts and God's promises is turned upside down on its head. That light is our ability to rebuild and reform and even reframe the sacred principles of our faith in every generation. That light is our ability to work for peace and unity, even when we are surrounded on all sides by division and strife. That light is our ability to look at the child of a poor carpenter and his wife, a child lying in a borrowed manger, surrounded by livestock and lowly shepherds, to look at that child and see nothing less than the Son of God. That light is our ability to look at the very greatest among us and the very least among us alike and to see in both the faces of God's beloved children. That's what the child in the manger actually taught us to do. That's the gift. That's the light. May we never mistake it. And may we continue to shine in the darkness until the whole world walks in the light.
Let us pray. Gracious Lord and God, on this one of the coldest and darkest days of the year, at the end of a year which has also seen a time of great darkness for many of us, help us to remember the light that came into the world when you sent your Son. Help us to remember even before that how many times in our story, in the story of the Bible, how many times when things seemed dark and hopeless and people put their hope in the wrong places, that still that light shone among them, that still your people were able to carry forward that hope to a new generation, reframing and reshaping the story as they went. Help us in this day and age not to mistake the gift, not to put our hope in the wrong people and places, but to be the hope for other people in our world, in our communities, in our families. Help us to be the love that you showed to us with the gift of your Son. Help us to be love and light to everyone we meet. Lord, we pray all of these things just as you taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.